having a people-centered workplace just for the fact that it's the right thing is good. But you know, if it's too touchy-feely or you're not quite on board with that, that's okay because it is the smart thing and the commercial thing to do. But before I jump into how you can enact some of this, I want to hear from some of you. Can we have the lights up just a little bit? What I'd love to know is what do you think is the one trait that distinguishes a truly great leader? What, in your opinion, is the characteristic of greatness? The difference between a good leader or even a great manager to a really great leader. Anybody, just shout out. Servant leadership. You guys are in the splash zone. I love it that you're all up here in the front. Yes, servant leadership. Thank you. Who said that? You did. I I've got a U1 stuck book for you. If you want to stick around, I'll sign it for you. Just for being the first to speak up with boldness and clarity. I always appreciate that in a leader. Who else? What's your favorite trait? Effective leader. How about you guys? Enthusiastic. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. And you yelled that out enthusiastically. So thank you. Honesty, yeah, baseline, integrity, honesty. All of those things absolutely inspired servant leadership, coaching other people, integrity, honesty, all of those things, being inspiring, so critical. But there's one other element, and I have been working, I worked 20 years in the corporate world, head of communications at Sony, Universal, Turner Broadcasting, many years in that world. Now, next, uh, in two weeks, it'll be 15 years as an executive coach and leadership consultant. So I've spent a lot of time on the corporate side and also on the business ownership side. And I work with countries, uh, countries, companies and countries across industries because it's always people and performance. I'm always looking at workplace behavior. So there's one other trait that I think is the most significant. Visionary. visionary. That's a good one. That's not what I was going to say, but you're dead on. Visionary. Uh, the most important and the most overlooked. And that one trait, you know it when you see it. It's the people that inspire you to take action, the people that despite any setbacks, any hurdles in front of them, they keep on going with an enthusiastic attitude. And that one trait is hope. And I was at Universal. I was, I was recruited to head up corporate communications at Universal. And it was one of those nice kind of high class problems when I was offered a job at CBS and at Universal at the same time and decided I would go to Universal because at that point in, in the history of the company, it, had, it held the record for the most stable management leadership in the history of entertainment. One guy, famous mogul, Lou Wasserman, at the helm of that company for 50 years and his second in command. So very stable, debt-free, you know, huge, but also as happens after a long time, they've gotten very stale. So a new owner had come in, uh, the Bronfman family owned Seagram's Liquor. At that time, every business unit head had changed in the span of 18 months. So there was a new president, there weren't any president, female presidents, male presidents, in motion pictures and music and television and consumer products all across the company, massive change. And when we look at what that does to people and why it makes them so nervous, we just often have this blanket, oh, people hate change. But there are underlying factors. Uh, sometimes people feel disloyal to their former employees if they, if they embrace the new. Sometimes they feel like, I don't, my skills are not up to par. I don't know what these people coming from the outside know that I don't know. There are all sorts of fears and concerns that get triggered. So for me, I thought, well, I'm, communica I'm the head of communications for this group. I'm just going to go out and communicate. I'll do what I do because I really believe we have to create a shared vision here. We have to get on the same page, and that's going to require some time together, some rapport and trust. So I was a, as a department head, one of the perks of the job was my little golf cart. So, you know, Universal Studios, anybody been to Florida or uh, Hollywood? It's big. It was 540 acres, and I set 15-minute appointments basically with anybody that would speak to me. And it wasn't always easy. I thought, well, you know, I'm 
this, meet with me. No, had no interest in the new team coming in. So I was persistent. And for about three months, my calendar just had these chunks of meetings with HR, accounting, the costume people, the producers, the on-air talent. I mean, anybody that was willing to sit down for a face-to-face. -face. And I got my little golf cart. And I drove past the New York town and past the Cowboy Village and the parting of the Red Sea. And I went out to all these places and sat down with people and basically just said, tell me about your job. What can I do for you? How can we work together? We're in all the basics, it did not take a rocket scientist by any means to figure this out. But I kept hearing, huh, no one from corporate has ever been over here before. And it was just that, let's break down the silos. Let's break down the walls and talk to each other, and then continue to build on that. And pretty soon, people started to see, you know, we were not the evil empire. We were not out to get them. If you have a process to fall back on, it steers you past your own fears and your own blocks. And in my book, You Unstuck, which one of you will get, I, I really I did a lot of neuroscience study. And basically, to boil it down, and I know many of you have scientific backgrounds, we feel first and think second. That's how we are wired. We don't have time to sort out the friends from the foes. We feel first, we think second. And if we give in to those fears, which we don't always recognize, sometimes they're just those little, uh, I call the immediate negative response. We just back off from the risk taking. If we don't have a process to pull us past that, then we'll, we'll surf along. We'll take the easier route as opposed to, I'll go for that big job. I'll try something even though I don't feel I'm completely qualified. And this is my process that I started years ago and now I've used with clients around the world in tech and healthcare and all sorts of uh, media companies. And it's really simple because I do believe our brain craves simplicity. First is clarify the vision. Now you all probably have a vision for your life and your career, but I want to frame it for you or have you frame it a year from now, if I said you can only accomplish one thing, now you could take this home and think about your personal life later, but in the workplace, if you could only do one thing and you're back here next year and you greet a colleague and you haven't seen him for a year and she says to you, hey, what'd you do this year? What's that one thing? What is that emotional assignment with which your life just wouldn't be complete? That's that one thing. Now, there's an interesting thing that, that we do when we overcomplicate life. Any overthinkers in the room? Yeah. We're great at that, women. I know, just finding your seat in the room was like, oh my God, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? <laughs> we all do that. Men, I, you come in, you plop down the end of the story. That's it. So. Congratulations. You have a natural predisposition for leadership. No. Lift as you climb, that is what it's about. And it's from Helen Keller, who's really one of my idols. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you all.